Well, welcome back, campers. Last year, uh, last week, we saw kind of the big picture. We had some really big philosophical things along with our uh, AAUW public policy person and Kim Churches involved on Saturday. Um, but now we're getting down to some details. So tonight, welcome to Claudia's classroom. So many of you know Claudia. She's been a branch president. She's been state AAUW president. She's been on the national board. And she spent, this is really impressive, she spent 10 years doing AAUW training. And she told me it was from Juneau to Albuquerque and from Boston to Guam. Now that's a pretty wide swath of territory. So she now serves on the Legacy Circle team and we hear from her frequently and she's very sincere about it and we love her for that. So you might say AAUW has been her job, but you could also say that she has had many years of wisdom and Claudia is a very wise woman. So now, Welcome to Claudia's classroom, and she's going to share her wisdom with us. Thank you, Pat. And Nancy, thank you for handling all the technical part of this. All right, I want you all to tell me if you've got the handouts. If you did, raise your hand, please. Did you get the handouts that Nancy sent? And I immediately got a, a response from one of our members, and I want to begin with that because I think it's important. Jenny Didium, who's the new state membership VP, wrote to remind me that the rules that I talk about tonight for meetings don't necessarily apply if you are on a local or state board or commission. In AEW meetings, you don't have to say what you said during the session. You often do, and it depends on what the rules are and the state laws. So I'm gonna begin by saying, if you are on a public board or commission, check to see what the rules and laws are that govern the meetings of your particular board or commission. Everybody clear on that? Yes? Okay. <laughs> We're gonna begin with handout number one, which has to do with effective meetings. And I put down some things that I've learned over the years and gotten from other people but I would like, I don't want to read it to you. Can you tell me if there are things you would add to this list? No, I'm not hearing anything. That's good. Okay. I said before you plan your next meeting, you should ask, is this meeting necessary? In companies and businesses, often they say, if the coffee and the Danish have not shown up yet, don't start the meeting. I kind of will equate that to AEW because I'm sure all of you know, as I do, if you are serving coffee and cookies at a branch meeting, you're likely to get half as, again, as many people as you would if you don't serve anything. People will come for food. So what I'm going to be talking about mostly are AAUW meetings and specifically your board meetings. I don't know how many of you are branch presidents or how many of you are presidents of other groups, but I learned many, many years ago that men often don't learn these things about running an effective meeting. And we women can often take over. Probably 30 years ago, there was a White House commission called um, Wages, Welfare, or What? And they traveled all around the country to big cities. Portland had one. Ted Gamble, the president of Pepsi, was the head of our committee. He at one point had three motions on the table, and I was sitting next to the lady from the League of Women Voters. He looked at us and he said, I have no idea what to do at this point. Could one of you handle this? So I'm telling you what you learned from AEW, you can use everywhere, and you can take over groups if you want to. So let's look at handout number two. I didn't realize how important this was when we started, that if your group has no rules, it can often get unruly. And I don't really mean that as a pun. Uh, I had a group for a while that was so bad that literally I had a sign that said, be nice or leave. And I put it up at every board meeting. 
So look at that and please tell me if there's anything that you would add to those rules. The rules are at the bottom. The reason you have them are at the top. And the main reason for that is that rules that are written by a group, produced by the group and written down by the group are more likely to be obeyed by the group. I want you to notice something else under there. Leaders are, are followed by as much of what they don't do as what they do do. A leader who's, in, a leader who's impatient, who gets angry easily or gets upset easily, that kind of becomes the rule in the group and you don't want that to happen. So be careful of what you do, what you don't do, please. Any other suggestions for the rules for the meeting for teams? Question, Claudia. If somebody refuses to leave, if they're not following the rules, how do you handle that? Literally, I walked her to the door and told her I didn't want her to come anymore until she was ready to settle down. She's a, 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 I can't even tell you who she is because many of you know her, but she has um, terrible pain issues. And when she doesn't feel good, she gets really nasty. And she insulted a member to the point where the member was ready to leave. So I just literally got her up and walked her to the door and made her leave. Anybody else got suggestions for that? Claudia, um, not, not for that particular issue, but one thing, uh, setting maybe it's for setting rules for teams or someplace else, um, reviewing the rules. Okay. You know, paying, at, paying attention to them. Yes. Um, I, I did a, remember the effectiveness training workshops that came around, what, 30 years ago or so? I was a, a trainer for some of those, and we reviewed the rules at the beginning of every single week. And you're not going to have 10 or 15 rules. You're likely to only have three or four. What's down below? Six. And the last one I threw in just for fun. So you may only have four or five rules. And if you review them at the beginning of every meeting, then nobody can say, I'd forgotten that or I, you know, I didn't know that. Everybody knows what the rules are. Okay, hand well, you, given that we're doing a lot of Zoom stuff, is there a rule that might help those early Zoom meetings go better? I don't know. Can you think of any, Kathy? You, you ran some of the best meetings I've seen in years. Can you suggest something for that? Well, it's, it's just the format of Zoom sometimes puts people back and not a participant as they try to become familiar with how things work. And I was, I have not, thought about it, but it seems there must be some sort of different, think about it, and if you get any brilliance, I'd appreciate it. Okay, and I will say that Nancy Brown talked, uh, we were talking last week, and she said she, she would be giving them Zoom meeting lessons on Zoom for any of us who wanted to, to attend that. So maybe we can send our suggestions to her. <laughs> Good idea. All right. Handout number three. Um, Claudia, um, can you wait? Can you wait a minute? There's a bunch of chat questions. Pat Squire, have you been monitoring your chat for us? Yes, I have. Thank you. So um, one person, Claudia, said a good leader makes sure everyone has a voice, but sometimes one or more person people dominate. This can be very frustrating. And while we do want to make sure everyone has a voice, how do you handle it when voices become overriding. Look down under the suggested rules and the first one is to stay on topic. Somebody who's going on and on usually gets off the topic pretty quickly and you can cut right in. Uh, those of you who watched the session on Saturday, there was Pat Lehman and Sue Plumpf and Kim Churches. Those people all are really good speakers and Georgia did a beautiful job of keeping everything pretty tight but moving along well. So you can always say, excuse me, but that's not the time for that. Let's get back to the topic. If it's somebody who's just plain rude, you may even have to take them aside after the meeting and say, I'm not going to let you do that again. Um, Claudia, something that I've found with leading meetings is not to take personally when someone else disagrees with you. Um, yes. And you just have to kind of put to the side. You, people get to disagree. 
people get to disagree, but they don't get to argue, um, at least not for very long. Um, I was doing a workshop for the Red Cross one time, and there was one young man who really just wanted to take on something that was part of the training, and he just would not let it go. And I finally said to him, is, is, does anyone else in the group want to talk about this? If you do, raise your hand. Nobody did. And I said to him, why don't you and I meet in the hall during the break and we can discuss this more. I didn't realize it, but there were two psychiatrists in that group. And they wrote on the evaluation, the best thing you did was get him out of the room, cut him off, get him out of the room, but give him a chance to talk later on his own. If, that, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Um, Claudia, often with the meetings, Go ahead. with the meetings that I run, often I have to say to people, thank you for your input. Yes. And, and then we just go on. That's a beautiful way to stop somebody. That and please let's stay on topic. Okay, can we go on to number three? Good, good answers. I'm assuming that was Jenny talking, right? Yes. Okay, three, please. Now we get into the meat of things. <laughs> All right, this is a standard agenda for almost any meeting based on the fact that all AEW branches, states, everything is bound by the rules of Robert's Rules of Order newly revised. Parliamentary procedure. At one convention some years ago, we had a new member who realized that if she said, I moved the previous question, it stopped all debate. So when you're looking at this sort of thing that tells you what to say each time, think of this as a training tool. This is a training tool for you, for your members. It's just basic, every day, every, everybody should know this stuff if they're on any kind of a committee and most people don't. So look at that, please go down the list I'm not gonna read it all to you, but I will say there are times when you can be very relaxed if you want to be and times when you shouldn't be. Um, the, one of the things you can ask for anytime is corrections to the minutes, but you cannot ask for corrections to the treasurer's report or the finance VP report. You haven't seen all of the bills and the payments, only the treasurer and maybe the president had seen those. So you can't ask. So if you're leading the group, you say, are there any outstanding bills to be presented or are there any questions? And then you say the report will be filed. You don't ask for a vote on it. You don't ask for anybody to be discussing various parts of it. If they have a question, they can talk to the treasurer later, but you don't want to fool it around at a meeting. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Under officer reports, if you follow a standard procedure, a standard list of officers every meeting, not only will it help you stay in, in line of where you need to be, but it will help them know when they are expected to speak. If you have one committee and then another committee and keep them in order every month, they know if I'm on such a committee, I follow her or I follow him, whichever. It helps them get ready. Committee reports come and go. And you might notice when Georgia called a board meeting for the state, there now and then there was somebody who wasn't on the board. And in fact, it happened again with Pat and Sue. They can invite anyone they want from another, for, who's heading another committee to come and report to the board or to be part of the meeting for a part of a discussion. So some of the committees won't be on your list every month. They may only show up once or twice a year. Claudia, it's Sue. I have a quick question. What do you feel about the convening report method that we've been using lately? I don't think it makes any sense, but that's just me. I'm sorry. Alice is a, Alice is a certified licensed professional parliamentarian. I'm not. Okay, okay no, no I'm, I'm referring to the convening reports where they're given out in printed form and not included in the meeting. It's, it's a phrase that is new to us. I was very glad you explained it at the board meeting. If you keep explaining it, then people will understand. It was not explained last year. And I think it confused people and they weren't sure why we were doing it. 
She's talking, she's talking about the officer reports that have been traditionally given in April to the board and in the summer to the board. And instead, they are posted and not given at the board meeting, right? Last April was the first time they were given to the delegates. That was the first time ever. But I did that. Alice has used that word in the past, but it wasn't explained. It's, it's new to us. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as you explain it each time. Did all the rest of you understand what she was talking about when she explained it? Yes. So when I explained it, when I explained it on Sunday at the board meeting is what you're referring to. And I've used this method in another board that I've been leading for a few years now. And um, it helped to save time. But at the same time, sometimes it could be um, a little hurtful for those officers that aren't able to give reports at the meetings. But when you're looking at already having a two-hour meeting, you've got to find ways to condense. Are you talking about the consent calendar? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, that's different. That's, that's different than the officer reports. But I understand the, condent the consent calendar. Yeah. That has to be explained. That's it. I think it needs to be explained. Okay, old business, there's no such thing. There is no old business. There's only business that's unfinished business. And if you're presiding, you should know that because you should have your minutes from the meeting before. Everyone else should know that too, but they won't, so you may have to remind them. Uh, new business, I want you to notice particularly announcements because I noticed this again and again in minutes. It, uh, your announcements are the last order and they should always include the date, time, and place of the next regularly scheduled meeting. I notice, in, and we're gonna to get to minutes in a minute, but I notice that a lot of people, a lot of groups don't do that. So you're left with the finish of one meeting and no idea when the next one's going to be. That's not fair to your group, and frankly, it's not permissible under Robert's Rules of Order, so please. I'm gonna do a page on what minutes should contain. Make sure your secretary sees that, please. Claudia, can I go back to committee reports? This is Eileen. Sure. Um, committee reports, I found in groups where uh, we don't have to be quite so fussy about Robert's Rules of Order, it often works better for me at least to take some of those reports in a priority order. I, I, on boards, even in a UW board, Certain people always knew they were going to be towards the end of agenda, and so they either got their feelings hurt, or they did they got bored, or whatever, whatever. So I used to scramble it up quite a bit, and I do that even more when I'm away from AUW meetings. But I think it, for for me at least, you, if you get your first your most important things done first, it usually I think makes or towards the top of the agenda, it makes for a higher interest level, higher energy. You're right. There would be some people if they were always at the end of the list might get their feelings hurt. Right. I'm going to assume that you are not working with a huge group of 100 people, that you're working with a smaller group where you can, you can mess some or change some of that stuff up a bit and say, you know, we've had Wendy as the last report for the last two months, so let's let her go first this time. Do whatever works for you and make your group comfortable. That's the, to me, that's the bottom line, is the group needs to be comfortable. As long as you stay in charge, have fun if you can keep them comfortable. Anybody else got a comment? Okay, let's go on to the next one then, please. Okay, this is what minutes should include. And, and I have to, I love my mother-in-law dearly. Some of you knew her, Barbara Gray in Cannon Beach, and she was in the Seaside branch. And they asked her to be secretary. Wrong. <laughs> She put down every word that everybody said and missed every single motion. And they finally called me and asked me if I would come over to the beach and fire her, so I did. <laughs> there are things that really have to be in the minutes and they should be in this particular order, starting with when the meeting is, where the meeting is, and most importantly, is it, an, is it a regular meeting or is it a special meeting? That should be in the very first sentence. The such and such, the, the regular meeting, for example, 
The regular meeting of the Portland Metro Inter Interbranch Council was held on Tuesday, May 11th in Vancouver, Washington at the such and such bank. Okay, telling you what kind of meeting and where it was held. Then the full name of the group has to be in there. And please remember, AEW doesn't have any periods in it. We don't have as much trouble with that as we did 20 years ago, but it's still a problem. Date, time, place of the meeting. And then a statement that the regular chairperson and the secretary were present, or if they're not, who substituted for them. That's important because 20 years from now, you need to know who led that meeting if you have a problem with it. If the group is fairly small, the names of those present and those absent, and whether or not they are excused. And uh, Pat and Sue did that, I noticed, with their board meeting. There was a listing of who was supposed to be there, who, and she said at one point, so-and-so was excused. That all goes in the minutes. Then you take up the minutes from the last meeting and whether they were approved. And you can say anything about that. You can say, are there any corrections to the minutes? Corrections covers everything. It covers substitutions. It covers things you want to take out. Just say corrections, and that's all you need. Anybody who has any comments about the minutes, changes they want, can throw it in then. And you write those, have the secretary write those in the column, the, the margin of the minutes. So that if, for example, you thought you had agreed to donate $400 to a group, but it was actually $350 and someone corrected that, secretary crosses out $400 and in the margin writes $350. Is that clear? Okay. All points of order and appeals made to the chair. This doesn't usually happen in a board meeting or a branch meeting, but it has happened at state conventions. And those have to be listed in the minutes and whether or not they were sustained. And if they were or weren't, why were they or were they not? That's another thing that 20 years from now may make a big difference in what, something that you decided. So that has to be listed. A brief statement of the reports. The consent agenda says that they're posted. That's really all you need for most of those. If somebody's feeling that they don't like that, that they're not giving any report, you might think about asking them, we're gonna print your whole report out, post it online. Please, would you give us the top three or four points of your report? At least that gives them a chance to stand up and speak to it. And it gives somebody else a chance to ask them a question. Okay. <laughs> if an election takes place, you're supposed to list the, the votes on each side. And I have to say, AEW National is not really good about this. Some years they do it. Some years they don't. When I ran for regional director, they did. And I won by 17 votes. Um, the next year, they didn't ever say that. There's nothing in our bylaws that prohibits you from saying what the vote is. And I can remember we had a kind of an argument about this. And our, the main point was, we're not little girls. We're all women of a certain age. We should have a certain amount of... of uh, confidence. If we lose, we lose. Don't, don't treat me like I'm eight years old by not telling me that I lost by five votes. If we're going to play in the big leagues, if we're going to run for local elections, if we're going to get out into politics, we need to be able to handle that kind of information. It's not that big a deal. Does anybody want to make a comment about that one? I have a question from further from before. This is Wendy Cook. Um, and this kind of is probably going to be obvious to you, but I'm new to all this. Um, you know, can you elaborate on what you mean by all points of order and appeals made to the chair? Like, give me some examples. We'll get to that if you don't mind in the next sheet. Okay. I'm going to have fun with the next one. Anything else? Okay. Please dump respectfully submitted. That hasn't been used for at least 30 years, but I still see it in minutes now and then. You just sign it with your name, secretary, period. That's all you need. Don't 
have respectfully submitted. Okay, let's go on. So, Claudia, um, minutes do not have to be voted on. Is that correct? They just need to be approved. They need to be approved. And then what you do, once you've gotten all the, the um, amendments or any kind of amendments, that have, and once you've gotten all the corrections, corrections, the minutes stand approved as read, as sent, as corrected, whichever. Yes, you, in effect, you skip a vote, you do it by consensus. If right. everyone's put in whatever their corrections were, there shouldn't be a vote against it anyway. That makes right. Thank you. Okay, let's go on. This, this gets into the fun part, and I particularly want you to, I blew this up as big as I could get it because I'm hoping you will use it. Um, my friend who discovered that if she said, I moved the previous question, it ended everything, was so proud of herself because we had four motions at a state convention with no discussion on any of them. Think about that for a minute. People started grumbling. So uh, I had a very good mentor in Marilyn Zook, who was president ahead of me, and both of us, at that point, years ago, the program VP moved up to president. So you knew when you ran for program VP, you had six years, two as program, two as president, two as the parliamentarian. So Marilyn and I both took a parliamentarian class the whole term before our presidencies. And she said to me, these are teaching moments. Don't be so rigid that you can't just relax and go with the flow and tell people what they need to know. So Beth stood up for the third time and said, I moved the previous question and everybody's voted yes, which means if you will look at your chart down in the second block, yes, it needs to be seconded. Well, there was always someone who seconded it, just being nice. And then there's no debate, there's no amendment, takes a two thirds vote and they were like sheep. They would just go along with her. So finally, I said, okay, that's enough of this. This was the Pendleton Convention years ago. And I said, do you realize what's going on here? I'm hearing all this muttering on the side of the room, and I'm assuming it's because you're not able to talk about the question. You're not able to debate whatever this motion is. Stop letting her stop you. Next time she moves the previous question, nobody seconded, and we'll just go right on. And from then on, it all went smoothly. The point of this is notice where the main motion falls in this chart. It's not the most important thing. It's two thirds of the way down and every motion above it is more important than the main motion. The main motion is what we all remember, but it is not the most important thing. The very most important thing is setting a time to adjourn. If you decide I've had it with this meeting tonight, I want to be out of here at 7.35, you can say that. You can make that motion. And if somebody seconds you, we can't even debate it. It's just a majority vote. So notice the order of those. Anybody who knows their parliamentary procedure can set a meeting back forever. Um, I, when I did the training for AEW, I was the travel visitor to um, Indiana at their state convention. They had five motions, including approving the budget, and there was not one second to any of them, and not one formal motion, and no real discussion. They just kind of said, does this sound okay? Yeah, sure. Well, you're told as a travel visitor not to interrupt. <laughs> so I called the executive committee meeting in the hallway, and I said, this is what's happened. At this point, anyone who knows their part of it parliamentary procedure could come in this afternoon and negate every single thing you've done this morning. Everything. Well, what do we do about it? So I said to the vice president, the program vice president, you write down all the motions. I move that and each motion that you've just passed. And then I said to the treasurer, you second each one of these. Just, I want you working as a team. We're going to go through all of this quickly. They did it. I ran into their district director about, I don't know, five years later at a, a national meeting. And she said, do you know what we did after you left? And I said, no. She said, we hired a professional parliamentarian who went around the state and trained every single branch. Yes, you can run anything you want now. All you need to know is this stuff. Okay. 
if you are taking a vote on a motion, this is where you can have some fun if you've got a fairly small group or a group that knows each other well. Um, I was the first public member on the optometry, state optometry board. When Dick Atia was governor, he wanted a, a public person on every health-related licensing board. So I got appointed to the optometry board. I knew I was the first public member because we all were. I, what I didn't know was I was the first woman. And the old boys didn't like that much. So I tried to um, use a little bit of parliamentary procedure because we were a public committee. And as Jenny said earlier, as I said about her comment, there are state rules, the things you have to do. You're, everything has to be open. Everything has to be, uh, anybody can look at it. And you need to remember that. So I was pretty careful with some of this stuff, but they kind of whipped into shape after a while. But in a small group, if it's casual, you can play with this. If you are taking a vote on a motion, you must tell the group what they are going to say for each side. You can't say, or you shouldn't say, no, you can't say, all those in favor, all those opposed. If they're smart, they're going to sit there and stare at you like dummies. You have to say, this is what you say if you're in favor. This is what you say if you're opposed. And you can change it up. At the state level, because we're a little more formal, we tend to say something like, all those in favor say aye, all those opposed say no. If in a small group, um, if any of you remember Margaret Drummond, she used to do wonderful things at our board meetings. She'd say, all those in favor say cat. All those opposed say dog. Uh, all those opposed say Monday. Whatever, she'd change everything up so that it was a different, you had to listen because she told you something different every single time. And you always take both sides of the vote for and against unless it is a resolution, for example, uh, let's say that, that Nancy Brown, God forbid, falls down and breaks her ankle. And somebody says, I move that we send a get well card to Nancy Brown. All those in favor say aye. That's it. You do not take a vote for those against. That's rude. You don't do that. <laughs> I, can, I can hear a few mutterings in the back. All right, let's go to a couple of these at the bottom that are a little difficult. The one right above main motion. Postpone indefinitely. Cannot interrupt the speaker or the leader. Yes, it needs a second. Yes, it's debatable. Yes, it's amendable. The majority vote. Look at that word, affirmative. Let's say that you want to reconsider. You can only ask to have it reconsidered if you voted on the affirmative side. Does that make sense? If you voted against this, you cannot move to have it reconsidered. But if you voted in favor and it passed and you've changed your mind, you can vote, you can ask to have it reconsidered. Now look at the bottom one, reopen nominations. It's the same thing. If you voted against reopening nominations and that passed, and you know that somebody else wants to do something and you're in favor of this person running or whatever, you can move to have it reopened, reconsidered, because you voted on the negative. And the chair usually will say, did you vote on that side originally? And you have to say yes. Questions on that one? Um, this is Betsy, and I have a question about the first, the second column that says interrupt. Can you um, give us um, an example of what that looks like? Who are we interrupting? How are we doing it? And it all, you know, it says in all cases, but four, three, it says you can't interrupt, but our meetings get interrupted all the time. Only time you should be able to interrupt the speaker or the leader of that particular meeting is a question of privilege, order of the day, and a division of the assembly. Question of privilege is, for example, um, and this happened at one of our state meetings. Somebody stood up, interrupted the chair, and said, Madam President, excuse me, but it is very hot in this room. Could
could we please open some windows? It was okay for her to interrupt because she was uncomfortable. The next one order of the day is when the chair for some reason gets off of the agenda and has mixed things up. You can interrupt the chair and say, Madam President, I would like to go back to the original agenda. We've wandered far and wide from that. You can interrupt her to do that. You can also interrupt for a division of the assembly. If you're having a vote on, um, oh, well, for example, we had, we, uh, Betsy and I, as the governance co-chairs, suggested that the technology committee be a standing committee on the state board with a vote. People voted yes for that. What she asked for was all those in favor, all those opposed. If somebody wants to, wants a count on that, they can move, they can interrupt, they could have interrupted Pat or I think Sue was running it then, and say, Madam President, I move for a division of the assembly, and that means everybody has to vote one at a time. Does that explain it, Betsy? I guess, you know, the concept of a, an amendment feels like it's an interruption, but in the column it says you can't interrupt for an amendment. No, you cannot interrupt to add an amendment, and we're going to talk about amendments right now. Okay. Uh, and I did, I purposely didn't do a handout on this because I told Nancy I wanted to do that. This, this to me is some of the coolest stuff ever. Did any of you in high school English diagram sentences? Do you know what I'm talking about? Diagramming sentences? Okay. I'm going to hold this up. Okay, this is what you would say if you, you have to begin every motion with I move that. Saying I think that would be a good idea is not a motion. You begin by saying, I move that. Now let's say you're the chair of this particular meeting and somebody says, I move that, whatever. You write the motion down, okay? Then somebody else comes up and, and Betsy says, I want to amend that motion by, so you as the chair do this. You're gonna diagram it like a sentence. Can you see that? Okay, and then somebody else says, well, now, wait a minute. I'm not sure that's going to do it all, so I want to amend her amendment. And you, as the chair, write it out like you're diagramming a sentence. At that point, you have three motions on the table. The original motion, the first amendment, and the second amendment. Do not ever let it go any further than that. That's about all people can handle in their mind. Three is enough. Three is plenty. So at that point, you begin at the bottom. We're going to take that last amendment. Let's say that the motion is we're going to spend $500 on something. The, next, the first amendment is, no, I think it ought to be seven. And the last one is, no, I think we shouldn't buy that. We ought to buy the, this. Take the last one first. Should we buy this or that? If it passes, then you include it in the amendment up above. We're going to spend $700 on this. Am I clear on that? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not using a real motion here, so it's a little harder. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Any questions on that? And then when you've got your second motion, your second amendment, which now probably includes the third one, that's your full motion and you vote on that. So you'll be voting three times on, the, on that last amendment, on the amendment before it, and then on the final motion. And it may be, by the time you get to that third amendment, that motion may be totally different than what you started with. But if you sketch it out on a page in front of you as chair, you'll always know where you are. And frankly, it, I think it really helped me remember where I was because I would forget sometimes, wait a minute, didn't we talk about no, we have to pass this one first. But don't go beyond three. It's just, it's too difficult to keep in your mind. If you had Sue, you, you helped me deal with this when we had our board meeting because we did come up with two amendments to an original. I had not seen that before. If I would have had the little diagram in front of me, it would have helped me with it. But you let, you let us through and you took us in the right direction. And I really appreciated your help with that. So thank you. So, so then if you get the third amendment, if somebody else says, wait a minute, this is... What you can say as chair is, 
We already have three motions on the floor. We need to clear those. Please hold on to yours and we'll take it after we've cleared these three. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Get rid of the ones you've got, get rid of these three. And if somebody has another point, start all over. Otherwise, you could go clear down this page and nobody would remember where you were and it wouldn't matter because you'd have it so messed up they couldn't vote. Which brings me to another point. You as the chair are always in control. You're the one who says, all those in favor say whatever you wanted to say, all those opposed it. When you call for the vote, repeat the motion as it finalized. If you end up adopting this second amendment, then it's part of this one. Read them together. If you adopt this one, then the whole thing is a part of the first one. Read them all together. And what you do is say, the motion before you is, I move that, and then run the whole thing through. In a big group, in a very intricate motion, you may have to do that twice. But your goal is to make everybody understand what it is they're voting on. Otherwise, you'll have people all over. Wait, 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 wait. What are we voting on? Are we, am I for this or against it? It's just a mess. Try to keep them in line if you can. And, and don't let this diagram overwhelm you, please. If you can use it, use it. As I said, the interesting thing with the woman who learned a little was that she controlled the state convention for two hours. Um, there were people afterwards who said, okay, I think maybe I need to look at that parliamentary chart and start thinking about what I can do and what I can't. If you're willing to do some of this in your branch meetings, if you do it in your board meetings, it will help with your branch meetings. If you'll do it in your branch meetings, it will help at state convention. Um, one of the branches I was in got really good at this stuff because we did it at every branch meeting and we kind of played with it. It was fun. But then they were not uh, nervous or shy at all about standing up at a state convention and, and proposing an amendment or making a motion or speaking any of this stuff. It didn't bother them at all. And if we do it so well at our state conventions that our Oregon members do really well at the national conventions. That's where it gets really important. And we are one of the states that, done, that has done this kind of training for at least 50 years that I know of. And we do it as well or better than any other state in the country. And it makes us look really good at national conventions. We can pretty much get what we want at any national convention. Any, so, I, Claudia, I don't know if you saw Mary Pat's chat, but she asks, prior to a formal motion being offered, is it not possible to have an informal discussion in order to try to reach a consensus and then have a formal motion? Of course, and you can do that. Um, there, that's where I say, if, play with your group a little bit. Say, wait a minute, I, my feeling is you're not really clear on this. So why don't we discuss it? And we'll throw out a couple of things the way it might work and let's see how it's going to work. Yes, you can do any of that stuff. I, you can't do that at the state convention, usually. But you can do it at a branch meeting, at a board meeting. Um, as I say, I don't, I'm not quite sure. Jenny brought up a good point. It made me think about public, public boards and commissions. They're bound by state law. And you need, if you're on one of those, you need to know what those laws are. Right. Get in most groups, yes, you could discuss it first. You can also do that by consensus. Consensus is a wonderful thing because you don't have to take a vote. You can say, my feeling is you want to come up with a motion, but you're not sure what you want it to be. Is that right? Should we just discuss this casually? Is there anyone who objects? That's the point of consensus, is that everybody's on the same page. So you can say, if we are all going to do this, if you really want to just discuss this, is there anyone who objects to our doing it casually? And if nobody objects, you do it. That's consensus. Okay, and one other thing is Peggy Shippen asks, um, and we've, you've talked a little bit about how previous question can sort of shut things down, but she says, what does, what does previous question really mean? I move the previous question means I want to vote on the motion right this minute with no more discussion. 
The previous question is the motion that's on the floor. And I move the previous question cuts off every bit of debate. There's not one word taken, not one word after that. You take the vote right then, yes or no. Peggy, does that answer your question? Pretty clear. <laughs> it's very clear. Okay, anybody else have questions on any of this stuff? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Elena, what? Is it you? Was it Elena? I have a question. Are you talking to me? This, this is Elena from Eugene and online. I don't understand most of these things on the list. I just wrote myself a note that said, look up parliamentary procedure, look for a YouTube tutorial. I guess it's a statement more than a question. Okay, this is very basic, and any parliamentary chart you see is going to have it just this way. You don't have to know a lot of this stuff, Elena, unless you want to really mess up the meeting. On the other hand, there are some things you should know, like that main motion and an amendment, and you should know things like privilege. If, for example, you can't hear me, you can interrupt me at any time and say, I can't hear you. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. A lot of it you may never, ever come across. Once in a while at our state board meetings at a state convention, I'm sorry, annual meeting, a lot of this stuff will come up. And if you know basics, you can have just great fun with it. Claudia, I'd like to interject in regard to uh, learning about these things and, and trying to do it the right way. Um, that when I was first getting acquainted with how to run a meeting, I had incredible, um, incredible training from a past presidents of the state uh, or parliamentarians I already knew. And one of the things that put me in really good shape was they said, write these things out so you have a script to rely on during the meeting. And uh, so I just wanted to interject that. It was invaluable for me to get in getting started to have that, those other voices that were so much more um, professional and, and knowledgeable than I was at the time. So uh, I highly recommend Get, get in touch with a past state president or get in touch with a parliamentarian. Doesn't even have to be an AEW member necessarily um, because that Robert's Rules of Order book is really thick. <laughs> yes, it is. And not many groups use much of it. I'm, this is basic stuff that most groups do use. But Marty, you're absolutely right. Get in touch with your predecessor. Uh, if, whether you're a branch president or you're on a committee, a state committee for another organization or whatever, get in touch with your predecessor. They can usually help you a lot. Um, as to the script, I have kind of mixed feelings about that because some of our scripts got to the point where practically every breath was written down. And to me, that wasn't really good training. If you had a partial script that had things like, this comes next, this is the person, this is her office and this is her branch without telling you what to say. To me, that was a better training exercise. So I would suggest if you're in a two year term, have a script the first year, but try to go without it the second year. And I think you gain a lot of confidence that way. And it, that helps it apply to other groups too. Um, as I said, when I was doing some of the training and there were other people, not AEW, I, I was a little easier handling some of that stuff because I had done it through AEW without somebody telling me what to say. And you kind of learn to think on your feet. Other questions? Okay. I'm gonna tell you one more thing. This is, I'm, I'm giving you some inside stuff here. I said that AREA, Oregon AEW has done better training with, a, with all of us for at least 50 years. I didn't know how bad other states were till I started going to them. But Cappy Eaton tried to tell us before Marilyn and I started traveling. She was in a state in the South. She was their travel visitor, their Saturday night convention banquet. There was um, a platform in front with a long dining table and all the officers sat there having steak and champagne. 
all the delegates sat on the floor of the, of the meeting room and had chicken and iced tea. And she came back and said, you wouldn't believe how separated some of these states are in their leadership and they're not passing anything on. It's like a secret sorority. So thank God we don't do that. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. We're getting close to time here. There's actually a question in the chat, Pat. Oh. Yes, I see that. It's from Peggy. She wants to have an example of when a subsidiary motion is made and when an incidental motion is made. Oh my. Um, I'm not I, seeing that on your chart. Well, subsidiary motions are all the ones in the middle and incidental motions are all Oh, the got it. Okay. Remember I said every motion is more important than all the ones below it. So the ones at the bottom, those incidental motions, are far less important, except now and then for division of assembly, which can interrupt the speaker. And that's if you have a feeling that people either, either they're not being counted right, the vote isn't being counted right, or there's something going on underneath. And you can ask for a division and everybody has to vote one at a time. That's an incidental motion. A point of order, that's kind of what happens now and then. I'm trying to think if it happened at the last board meeting. When somebody says something and it's not quite right, and, and for example, they give the name of a committee and it's not quite right, you can raise a point of order and say, no, the actual name of that committee is such and such. That's an incidental motion. Uh, and it doesn't mean I move that, okay? Same with lay on the table. If you are trying to decide something and it goes on and on and on and nobody seems to be getting anywhere and it, the time is running out and everybody's tired, someone can move. That one is a motion. I move that we lay this question on the table. And that means you put it off till the next meeting. Now this can get tricky because I've seen it at the national convention. You have to say when you want to bring it up again. I want to lay this motion on the table until our next regular meeting. If you say, I want to lay this motion on the table and you don't say when you want to bring it up again, it kills it. And I've seen that done at conventions. Peggy, does that answer your question? So a motion has to have been made already? Yes, let's say yes, you're discussing something. Yes, you're discussing a main motion, and these are all the things you can do to it. Lay on the table, tell whenever you want to do it. Previous question, that means you have to vote right now. Limit or expand debate. Debate on this issue is five minutes. We've got seven more people who want to talk. I move, we expand the debate by five minutes. Okay. Um, so, so before you can, and, you know, I'm looking at the next chat question that by Wendy. And I wonder if my question and her question kind of goes together um, because I'm just trying to get the order of things here is that um, you, a motion is, a topic is presented by like a chair and then um, a motion is made on about that topic and then all these things follow. Often nothing follows. Often it's just okay. Let's have, let's do this. No, but I mean it, that is that is the order. If you're going to interject any of these things, motion has to be on the floor. And these are the types of things that can be interjected. Yes, that's what. The so so somebody can say that it can be referred to a committee if we start talking about something. And let's see, um, is there? Oh, the vote. Can the chair, what is, does the chair present uh, the topic because it's on the agenda? And then can the chair said, say, well, maybe we need to move this on to a committee or does the chair, can the chair just have to wait till somebody else says that? What can the chair do, suggest and not suggest? Yes, the chair can say, um, I think this may be something we need to refer to a committee. And you can always, vote against that if you don't want it to be. If you want to discuss it and settle it right now, you vote against that. 
So the chair can um, ask um, to have something laid on the table. They, the chair can actually model some of these suggestions. Yes. But uh, except on this one point of order, that would be not the chair doesn't vote on that because somebody is actually objecting to what the chair is doing, right? Okay. Notice, uh, let's, let's stay with subsidiary motions. Those okay. are like amendments to the main motion. They all have to do with the main motion, and they're, that's how you're going to handle it is one of these things. Lay it on the so table. So subsidiary motion. Okay, so that's, that's, a subsi that's what subsidiary motions are. The ones on the top are privilege, and that has to do with you personally. Comfort. Or, yeah. Comfort. Personal comfort. Okay. The ones on the bottom, the incidental, have to do, again, with this main motion and what we are doing with it our actions. We can either point of order, I want to correct something, division of the question, I want to see this, this particular motion actually covers two topics, I want it divided. Okay. We're going to meet now, at 10 o'clock, I want to vote on Monday and I want to vote on 10 o'clock. Okay, so now I'm, I'm taking up a lot of time here, but I'm just wondering, um, I have heard that you're are you well let me ask the question are you supposed to say okay we've got this topic let's discuss it and then there's discussion and then there's a motion usually yes you hope that's how it will go oh okay good so that's okay and usually that will be on the agenda and yeah okay on the agenda so you know okay the next the next topic is whether or not we have our annual book sale this year let's okay discussion and then somebody will say oh, because of COVID I move we do not have our book sale then you, then you get into that as a separate discussion so yes those, those okay. are the amendments okay thank you that was very good I was kind of I do things you know in this sort of uh, outline form in my head so I, I didn't I needed some spaces filled in okay let's thank go you. to the secretary's minutes a minute let's let's say there's a motion on the table We've been discussing it. Somebody raises a point of order. It can't interrupt. It doesn't need a second. It doesn't get debated. It can't be amended. The chair makes the decision on that. Say the point of order is, uh, I thought we were going to call that committee the Committee on Technology. Then the chair decides, no, we were going to call it the Technology Committee. And the, the secretary writes that in the minutes. The point of order was, is it called this? The chair ruled no. It's called that. Oh, it's, so point of orders are the chair is the only, is the, the decider. Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 okay. Okay, I misunderstood what that meant. Okay. Huh. Privilege and order of the day. The chair decides on those also. Um, her privilege is interesting, and you can say it a couple of ways. Uh, I kind of threw it in at the at the start of um, the annual meeting. I asked for a, I rise to a question of privilege. I wanted to say hello to um, Nyla Chilton, who was Washington's president between Mar with Marilyn and I overlapped. She was the end of Marilyn's term and the first of my term. I didn't know she had moved to McMinnville. So I asked for the privilege of saying hello to her. And the chair said, yes, you can do that. Okay, anything else on that? Don't let this throw you, please. Don't let this overwhelm you. Have some fun with it if you can. If you've got a board that's open to this kind of stuff, Play around with it a little bit. As I said, Beaverton got really good with this because we had people who thought it was interesting stuff. And frankly, we had a couple people who thought, you know, we can control the state convention if we can handle all this. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the, we're running out of time. Let's go on to number six, please, Nancy. Actually, there's another question. Okay. Yeah, Elena, um, Claudia is asking, <laughs> If you refer to a committee, but the committee doesn't yet exist, how do you handle it? You, can, you appoint a committee. You can say, 
Um, would you like, it? okay, there's been a discussion. Somebody's gonna say, I re move that we refer this to a committee. We don't yet have a committee, but we can start one. And who's willing to be on that? And what are we gonna call it? And yes, you can, you can do that if you don't have one already. It doesn't happen very often though, because usually if there's that much discussion and that much disagreement, you either uh, lay it on the table to discuss it at another meeting or you um, expand, spend debate, whatever you want to do, you don't usually refer it to a committee unless there's a committee there. If there's not, create one. You can do, you're the chair, you can do what you want. I shouldn't say that. Never forget that. Okay, at a successful meeting, and here's where I'd like some information from you too. Here's a checklist uh, that I've used and that I've seen other groups use, and I think some of them are, are more important than others. I think the most important thing is that the meeting starts and ends on time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what <laughs> ending this, this meeting, because I know a lot of them have gone till 8.30, but I knew what the time to start was and we started then. If you know that all your people aren't there, if you, for example, I was do, do you all know where Norman, Oklahoma is? That's where Anita Hill was from. Uh, I went to train their um, Oklahoma State Board for a three-day weekend, and I knew that there was a group of people from one of the towns who had problems with weather and were not going to get there for at least half an hour after the meeting started. So I started on time, and we all did some other things. If any of you were at last summer's conference when I did the thing about your thumbs, which thumb is on top? Mm -hmm. I did that. I did a, a handshake thing. I did... Um, introduction thing. What I did was give them all a little extra training that the people who were late didn't get, but I didn't start in the meat of it until those people got there. And for those of you like me who were born and raised on the West Coast and traveled from Canada to Mexico, being in North Norman, Oklahoma scared the hell out of me. I went out in the back. I had them doing something for an hour and I went out in the back, 180 degrees, not a tree, not a shrub, not a telephone pole, nothing. I got nauseous and had to go back inside. <laughs> I'm used to seeing mountains. Okay. Um, one of the nicest things about being a member of the Hillsboro Forest Grove branch is the, that number three, that third one down. Every time anybody comes to a meeting, everybody says, hi, so-and-so, it's so good to see you. How have you been? Everybody says hello. And... Claire Berger, who's the president, always has an agenda. It's wonderful. Board meetings, it's so easy to know what's going to come next because she's always got the agenda. Um, if you can, assure that everyone contributes. This is very hard for me because I can't see you. So I'm relying, on, I, and I purposely have my screen so I'm not looking down at you all the time. Otherwise, I'd be like this the whole time, checking everybody out. Um, but you, you can look around your room and think, okay, she hasn't said anything tonight. I wonder what she's thinking about this. And ask her specifically, okay, we've been talking about this new whatever committee. How do you feel about it? Do you have suggestions for us? What would you like to see this committee do? Bring people in any way you can. Voting your consensus. Voting if it's really important. Consensus if it's not. Um, as I said, it, the, the rule with consensus is, does everyone agree? So that's why it can't be too complicated. And if anybody says, no, I don't agree, then you're gonna have to go to a more serious discussion and some voting. Breaks are taken as appropriate. I, the, the state conventions, now annual meetings, have been really good about this and they realized that five minutes wasn't long enough for a break. Now they're usually about 15, which gives you time to get down to the bathroom and back. Okay, what would you add to this list? Anybody? Come on. <laughs> Claudia, Peggy has a question about the minutes again. She wants to know if it's appropriate for the secretary to send the minutes out to the board prior to the next meeting and ask for any corrections to be made and sent back to the secretary. Yes, it's appropriate to send them out. If she wants to ask them for corrections, then she can. But the president needs to announce those at the next, or at the next meeting. In other words, the secretary can't do that on her own. 
the president is always in charge. And if you say, well, I noticed on such and such a page, you said this and, it, and you should have said that, the secretary can note that, but usually what she does is tell the president who announces it at the next meeting. Uh, that happened in the interbranch council quite a bit because we met two months apart. You know, there was two months, or a full two months between meetings. And so I would say when the minutes were sent out, so-and-so noticed this, and corrected it, so please, we will correct this in our minutes. And again, the secretary crosses out what's wrong, writes what's correct in the margin, so that 20 years from now, you know what it was. Peggy, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I didn't, uh, I didn't even know that could be done, and uh, it's interesting. Your answer was very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it saves some time. And then um, Sue Klump says, perhaps add to the checklist a thank you for attending statement. That sounds nice. And let's go further. Thank you to whoever your speaker was. Thank you for coming like tonight thank you for attending thank you for participating that's a really big one um when i do, i don't know if any of you remember volt volt was volunteer leadership training that aew at the national level put together eight six-hour workshops on two levels and um we were we were doing it under a grant from the henry loose foundation and time magazine so it all had to be free one of the things we talked about mostly was volunteers. How do you keep your volunteers happy? Thank them. That's the best thing you can do in any form you can do it. Thank them. Thank them emotionally. Thank them with love. Thank them often. Thank them in front of other people. People will almost die for you if you just tell them, thank you, I appreciate what you did. So Sue, thank you that I, I'm sorry I forgot that. Shame on me. Anything and Claire Berger added um, something that we actually discussed at the beginning, Claire, and that was that there is a set of ground rules. So I think that was the first page maybe, Claudia. Um, and then Kathy Dew commented that you provided great resources and you're good at teaching new content, which is so true. And then Sheila Raymerman added at the end, all items on the agenda were addressed and then maybe summarize action items. Yes, yes. And uh, Claire, yes, the handout number two has all the rules on it. Um, as I said, that was, that was really good with our group that was in so much trouble. And by reading them at the beginning of every meeting, it reminded everybody and, and in effect, we're gonna follow these. You know, be nice or leave. We're, we're following these rules. <laughs> Anything else? I want you to know that the be nicer leave, I bought the sign and I did, I did take it to every one of my board meetings, but my children heard about that. Now my, now my babies are 54 and 57, but they bought me metal signs that each one has, each sign is one word. It says be nice or leave. <laughs> On the <little> house. <laughs> Anything else for the good of the order? Uh, by the way, Sue Klump finished the board meeting by saying that. Is there anything else for the good of the order? That's a wonderful phrase because it allows you to not only discuss something that's serious, but also to discuss something that's maybe a little lighter. It's just whatever's going to keep us going. If you want to do something that's fun, you can say, okay, for the good of the order, I think everybody who has one should hold up their smile. <laughs> anything you want to do to make it fun. But let them know, okay, we're wrapping up. Is there anything else that we've missed? So I will ask anything else for the good of the order. This is Wendy Cook. I have one more question about the minutes you had mentioned. We don't vote on them, we just file them once everything's been done. If you're at a board meeting and you're doing that, but you don't have a quorum, can you still do that? Ah, let's get into quorum for a minute. You can do anything you need to do without a quorum if you say we will take the vote at our next meeting, provided we have a quorum. You, what you do in effect is postpone it. Go ahead and discuss it. Um, with minutes, you don't vote on them anyway. 
you just correct them and then they're filed. But if it's a motion and there's not a quorum, there, and this happens with branches quite a bit. Uh, Lake Oswego some years ago got into a position where they never had a quorum at their board meetings and they finally just told all the members, we need more people. We need all the board officers to show up because we've had two meetings in a row where we couldn't actually pass any business and we need to pass it. Yes, just move it to the next one. And by the way, um, I have to say a special hi to Wendy because she also played a viola. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Does anyone else have any final questions for Claudia? Claudia, thank you so much. You are so wise and so helpful. We really appreciate your comments and your instruction. Claudia's classroom. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I think it was very nice of all of you to get up and eat. And Nancy and Pat, you guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. And don't forget to tune in tomorrow night to learn about some exciting branch programs with Pat Lehman as our moderator. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye. Have a good Thank you.